so there's two schools of thought. So there's two types of distinct training. Well, one of which is what we call hypertrophy, which is building muscle size. The other is strength, where we're looking at how a muscle exerts a force. So how strong or how, how something, how heavy I can pick something up. Um, when you're building hypertrophy, so muscle size, you're looking at higher reps, bigger volume, less recovery. When you're looking at focusing on strength, you're looking at lower reps, probably more recovery in between, maybe less sets. And I think it's important to do both. And throughout my training history, I've typically done a phase of maybe six to eight weeks on one, six to eight weeks on another. Um, so welcome, 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 Beth Wright. I'm so glad that we actually managed to sit down and have this conversation because it's been a long time coming. Um, lots of rearranging, lots of um, back and forth, because let's face it, you're in Hong Kong. I'm in Grand Cayman. Like, this is amazing. That we're even sitting well, here together. This is like... one of the beauties of podcasts, right? That we can have this conversation, albeit that it's like five o'clock in the morning for you and <laughs> 30 p.m. for me. So thank you. I know, 13 hours difference. That's no joke, but we actually managed to pull it off and I'm actually quite proud of us. I think we've done well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we were just discussing actually how um, your, you know, your, your, you know, the fitness industry in Hong Kong, how they're so um, in need of corporate wellness and like guidance from fitness professionals and how you're so busy with, you know, doing the, you know, doing the talks and the classes and the training, like how is it all going for you over there at the moment? Yeah, do you know what? It's um, during COVID, um, Hong Kong was completely locked down. And I know that was the same for most of us in most parts of the world. But for us, what that meant was we literally couldn't leave Hong Kong. There was no one in, no one out. Um, everyone was working from home. And I think wellness as a topic um, was well and truly forgotten for most people. It was a question of just getting through the day, getting the job done and surviving. And now we're at the other side. Most people are back in the office. Hong Kong is open. People are coming in. People can leave. Um, what is truly wonderful is that corporates are recognizing the importance of uh, their employees well-being um, and I think we as individuals are recognizing the importance of our well-being too so what I'm seeing now is my one-to-one -one clients coming to me and saying right now I want to focus on this um, I'm seeing more people in the gym um, I'm seeing lots of corporates uh, do corporate wellness talks from topics from sleep better manage stress better fertility was something I, I was talking about today so mm. yeah there's lots happening I think it's long overdue we had a complete hiatus for three years mm. um, and I'm excited to see it sort of coming to the forefront of people's minds and I love to hear how people in Hong Kong now they're they're actually starting to well actually globally um, people are starting to think about themselves and it's like okay so now the the panic is over of the pandemic um, now we're going to focus on ourselves we're going to put our fitness first and you know just kind of yeah. putting ourselves to the forefront and working on um, you know being our best selves which is you know a really really great thing um, but that's what I love about what you do so you you work primarily with women right Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um. So you do um like work with um hormones, with sleep, with yeah. um you know managing stress, which is basically you know they're the roots of what we need as women to kind of thrive. So what do you find um your clients come to you? What what are the biggest problems that they come to you with at the moment? Yeah. Do you know what I would say? Probably. 70 to 80 percent of people that come to me in the first instance come with a goal so it might be um lose fat it might be fit into a dress for a wedding it might be to gain muscle it might be to sleep better like a specific targeted goal yeah. but the way that i work is i look at everything so yeah you I go deep to... you go to the roots deep. You're like okay you want to lose fat but let's get under there first lay let's down, see lay how... down. yes Yes. And, and I learned that the hard way myself by realizing you can't just focus on one area without addressing the other. Um, so you can't just look at exercise, you need to look at nutrition, supplementation, how you sleep, how you recover, how you manage stress, your social relationships, because if you don't address all of them, they'll act as handbrakes to, to stop you from getting closer to your goal, at least at, not at the same speed that you might want to. So I would say, People come to me with a goal, and by the end of the three or the six months, we, we've worked on three or four or five different areas. Gosh, 
And I bet they have such a surprise when they get working with you. They're like, you know, they go home to their partners or their kids or their families and they say, guess what Beth's got me doing? She's got me going to bed at this <laughs> time. And But it's true. Like, it's so it's important true. to do it's all true, of these elements. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is uh, uh, one of the ways that I work, which is slightly different to a lot of other coaches, is I believe in accountability, like strong accountability. So most of my clients will check in with me daily. And I don't mean that in an intrusive, they have to call me every day or meet up with me, but even just as simple as a WhatsApp message. And so, you know, they have to hear from me every single day. And if they don't (laughs) contact you, do you contact them? Oh, yes, I do. Yes. (laughs) That was my text today. Yes. And, you know, high accountability gets results like it really gets results and I think you know you asked me at the beginning do I mainly work with women I do and one of this that's for a couple of reasons like first and foremost I think women often get forgotten you know whether it come becomes from the perspective of even like research in sports and nutrition and medicine women are left out but just generally women kind of sort of get ignored to a certain extent um, when it comes to knowledge and sharing of knowledge. Um, And the second reason um, is that women put everyone else first, in my experience. And what I see here, in particular in Hong Kong, is the women that I work with often, they have kids, often they have a full-time job, they'll have a partner, um, they'll have family, and they will put all of those people first, even even the dog goes before them, and then they'll think about their health and their well-being last, where in actual fact, I will put them first. And if they put themselves first and prioritize their health and their well-being, you can be a better mom, a better mm-hmm. partner, a better friend, a better daughter, um, a better employee. Oh, it's like so to have someone like you on their side, it's like it's like a gift to themselves. It's like I'm gonna gift myself this um, you know, this attention. And you're so right. I mean, from my perspective. Have, having a family having kids having young kids below the age of five two of them um gosh it's it, they're just so much work <laughs> like I'm so tired and um you know I I feel it and you know it also you know I'm at home and I'm kind of doing things for the kids and then when the hobby comes home you know I've got to be on my I've got to be like you know everything's fine everything's good yeah. like dinner's ready and yeah. you know kind of smile because I don't want to you know bum him out with anything that I've been going through during the day so it's so yeah. true like um from my perspective that's my personal experience but I know you know different women have different kind of you know experiences yeah. but you're right we tend to put people first um yeah, but yeah um but then also the the age of the women that you work with do they tend to be um kind of working towards perimenopause menopausal age or do you have a whole range I have a whole range I would say um because I'm interested in women of all ages I'm interested in how our bodies our minds our hormones change throughout every stage of our life, really from, you know, when we go through puberty, when we're looking at fertility, um, when we're heading towards perimenopause, menopause, beyond. Um, So I have a whole range of clients. What I will say in the last three to four years, um, the number of women I work with who are in perimenopause and menopause has has increased dramatically. Um, And it's not because more women are going through menopause, it's because globally more people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that is um I mean just such a revelation like I remember when my mother went through it and she had really no idea what was going on you know the whole family were were miserable um you know and and today you know back talking about how there's knowledge gaps when it comes to women you know we didn't have the research to look at what women were going through and how we could support them so now research is finally catching up people are now looking at what women are going through how declining hormones affect them, whether it be from nutrition to sleep to recovery um, to cognition. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely seeing more women within that age bracket. Yeah. And speaking of something that's getting more attention is the topic of today, which is basically muscle. Yes. For women, like that is definitely getting more attention and specifically talking about training and talking about protein intake. 
because you know healthy muscle is all about pulling those two levers right it's all about having the training and having the protein and if you've got those I've got to hang on those two things then yeah. you know obviously along with the sleep and all of that but then yeah. those are the two main levers when it comes to muscle so um, I'm really excited about talking uh, talking about muscle and um, because yeah. I personally love it I think we both love training um, we both love, you know, lifting those heavy weights. I've seen your videos. <laughs> what same, you-, same. you and I are always giving each other high fives, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> like, Way to go. Great weight. Um, what, <laughs> are you, what, are you, what are you, what are you, what are you deadlifting at the moment? Just out of curiosity, because the um, videos are like, they look heavy. Well, so I'm, I weigh around sort of 50 ish kgs and I'm deadlifting sort of 70. 75 so well I'm only five I think like you know there's nothing on it <laughs> I stood up I wouldn't <laughs> like different just sitting down um so which I'm pretty proud of um how many reps eight, is that I could probably do six to eight That's reps good. yes yeah yeah so uh and I had an ACL injury at the beginning of the year so that set me back so I'm just about coming back from that now um but yeah I'm similar to yourself I love training there's nothing for me more empowering than going into the gym, doing a strong workout and then walking out. And I th- I genuinely believe the strength that you gain in the gym from confidence, physically, mentally, I think you take that into every area of your life, honestly. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's so funny you say that because pretty much every woman I've spoken to um, on this podcast, but then also outside of the podcast as well, they all say the same thing. When yeah. you do weight training, you just, the confidence you feel in your body, in your uh, yeah. mind, in how you hold yourself day to day. Um, it really, it honestly, honestly, <laughs> it makes such a big difference. Jeez. And you don't know until you start doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've just started, uh, we were talking about this earlier offline, but I've just started working in a gym, which is women only. Um, and what I've seen there, which is truly, truly incredible, is the support that community of women only gym will provide and women going in there who have never had the confidence to be in a gym before but who are gaining strength gaining technique improving their form encouraging each other and every time I teach a class there I see the women walk out three inches taller and it's really 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 empowering for me as a coach and for them as individuals yeah um, when I was working as a personal trainer gosh Oh God, how long I'm about to do maths at 5 30 in the morning. Um, but like so <laughs> I was coffee. I was like 21. So that was about I don't know, I'm 37 now. So everyone else do the maths. But um back then, um, in the free weights area, you know, it was yeah. around the corner and it was just guys. And I remember women were just never in there. And there was there was only like one or two like during the day. And I, I don't know how things are in the gym now, though, because um, I haven't been to a membership gym for quite a while. But are women starting to go in there more or is it still a problem? Is it still just women still afraid to go in there, do you think? I think it depends on the gym. I think mm. the ethos, the culture of the gym very much makes a difference. Um, the gyms that have a very distinct designated free weights area with big heavy weights, I think it's intimidating for That's most harder. women. Yeah, you're right. Because men will congregate there. The gyms, and this is maybe some a tip for anyone that's a gym owner, but the gyms which are sort of more open in terms of their layout mm. um, will encourage women to sort of integrate throughout the whole of the gym. I think you're seeing um, more of a focus on educating women how to move, technique and form, particularly during COVID because we were doing stuff online line so we had to sort of watch it and learn that way but um yeah I still I still think there's a way to go Mm, okay so um I know that some of the women listening to this um they they probably are like okay so if I want to start weight training (laughs) want to just tell me what I've got to do how many times how many reps what have I got to eat so that's what I want to break down with you because I think you're the perfect person to do this with so first of all why is it important to build muscle as a woman like why should we be doing this in the first place okay I think um I think one of the main reasons um, is that we, as we age, and I, I'm assuming your audience is of all different ages, um, but from the age of 30, we naturally lose muscle mass. And the there's, there's numbers are something along the lines of up to 5% of muscle mass is lost per decade after the age of 30. Now, that's just through pure 
attrition that's through pure aging there's nothing really um that, that sort of we're doing to make that happen it's just how the body functions but what we can do is we can slow that down and we can offset it and you and I are going to talk about that today um so first and foremost, we want to think about healthy muscle because we're losing it. Um, healthy muscle makes us more metabolically active. We burn more calories at rest. It improves our overall health metabolically. It gives us good posture. It makes us strong. It makes us feel good. It makes us look good. Um, and there's actually um, there's a couple of doctors that, that talk about this, but one in particular, Dr. Gabriel Lyons, who you've talked about before in the past, she talks uh, about muscle as being the organ of longevity um and and it and it truly truly is so that's sort of one of the reasons why I think uh having healthy muscle is really really important yeah and there's this really scary um kind of opinion out there that your muscle mass um is directly related to your lifespan which is really I don't know if you've heard that before but um have but basically sarcopenia is which is basically the disease of muscle loss um especially yeah. as we age when people just lose yeah. their muscle mass um that is basically frailty yeah, is basically absolutely. the the it's it's one of the most dangerous things basically for someone's mortality yeah. like someone's lifespan and to prevent that is really really important as we age so yeah, yeah that's I, I can see why it's the you know, longevity the organ of longevity yeah. Yeah. And, and actually to sort of I guess to tie into that um, is not only do we lose muscle mass as we age we lose bone density as well and that and as we lose bone density so loss of muscle mass is sarcopenia loss of bone density can be osteo osteopenia or osteoporosis as it progresses further and that's where the frailty comes into it um, and resistance training, um, eating well, protein, which we'll come on to, that can help offset both sarcopenia, muscle loss, and osteoporosis, bone density loss. Um, so um, the, I think the point you're making is the frailer we are, if we were to have a fall, our risk of mortality increases by some exponential um, percentage. So yeah, the, the stronger we are, the, the better our bone density, the more muscle mass we have, the healthier we will be, and the better our longevity will be. Okay, so if somebody was to go into the gym and like, hey, I don't know where to start. What do I need to be doing? What sort of what sort of movements do you recommend for somebody? And what sort of repetitions do you recommend? What sort of sets do you recommend? Because um, just personal, um, just a personal story here. Um, I have a friend, a childhood friend. And recently she's been talking to me about training, been sending me her program. And like, literally, I forget how much guidance people need. I, yeah, I forget that yeah. people want to know like, oh, how many times do I need to do this? Uh, what, what do yeah. I, what exercise, are these exercises okay? Like how many times do I need? So I think that's why I wanted to break it down with you. So first of all, what, what sort of movements and exercises do you think are really important to prioritize in the beginning? Gosh, okay. I think first and foremost, what I would say is if you have never been into the gym before, and there are lots of women out there that never have, I would definitely get a coach to help you when, when you first go in, to show you how the equipment works, to show you how to move, also to do like a movement assessment to see how that person moves, because depending on your stiffness, your mobility, any previous injuries, your height, your weight. Some exercises will work for you and some won't. Some might need some kind of adjustment. So without question, I would get some help. I wouldn't just go into the gym and start moving things around. Um, and I don't think you need too much help. You just need someone to do a movement assessment um, and, then, and then give you some guidance on some basic moves. And then in terms of basic moves, um, the ones that, we, that I would do a movement assessment on would be a push move, a pull move, um, a hinge move and a squat move. And, and maybe that's a bit too much detail really to go into now, but what you're trying to look at is using all of the different muscles in the group and making, in, in the body, sorry, and also making sure that you move in a functional way. Right, so like upper body push, would you mean like a bench press or? It could be a bench press yeah. or which, um, I guess a horizontal push or it mm. could be overhead press which is you know shoulder press which would be a vertical push yeah. a pull could be um a row mm -hmm. where you're where you're 
pulling in towards you, that would be horizontal, or pulling down, that would be vertical. Um, mm. A hinge movement would be something like a deadlift. Yeah. Uh, and a squat would obviously, a squat is probably the, the, the perfect example of that. And a lot of these movements you can do with body weight, um, you know, particularly the lower half to start with, to get the movement pattern mm. um, before you start to add any weight. And for, for a lot of people, you know, hinging isn't actually a naturally you know easy move yeah. it's, <laughs> it's yes it's, yeah, important. It's, it's functional so if you think about you know how do we pick up two shopping bags and we go to pick up two shopping bags we're effectively doing you know either a squat or a deadlift yeah. depending on how we do it so the better we can do those moves the better we can translate that into everyday life and I always like to recommend compound exercises for women mm. because um you know it, it, it's the biggest bang for your buck so you're yeah. using more muscles in one exercise. But then also um, I find if, you know, a woman isn't looking to build too much muscle mass and she isn't really, um, you know, she isn't really kind of, she's just wanting to do it for health, then, um, you know, bicep curls, tricep extensions and those things, when you're isolating small muscle groups, yeah. I just think, oh, don't just don't waste your time on those. Um, just do the compound <laughs> first and then, you know, do the isolation yeah. stuff um, just another time, you know, if you want to work yeah. on that before. Um, is that something that you agree with or do you like to do the um, isolations? So, you know, what? it's a really good question. And I agree with you in principle because Compound movements, meaning you use more than one muscle group, will get you the biggest bang for your buck. You will mm. utilize muscle fibers, um, you'll burn more calories, um, you'll build more muscle. But for someone who's never exercised, a compound move is really technical. Right. And if you think about how hard it is to coach a deadlift or how hard it is to coach a squat, and I'm having to do that now, even for myself to work around my injury. So I'm having to rethink how I coach myself. It's technical. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a combination of a little bit of everything because you want someone to learn some basic movement patterns, um, but then you still want them to feel that, like they've had a, a good workout. So maybe you might spend 10, 15, 20 minutes on a compound move, maybe just one a session, and then you can work on smaller muscle groups for the rest of the session. Um, because I think it's important that you enjoy it as well. Yeah. So what sort of um, repetitions do you usually recommend for people? So if you are starting out with a beginner and then yeah. as they get better and as they start to maybe want to change, how would you yeah. recommend they change their reps and then how many sets? Um, what do you recommend? Um. So there's two schools of thought. So there's two types of distinct training. Well, one of which is what we call hypertrophy, which is building muscle size. The other is strength, where we're looking at how a muscle exerts a force. So how strong or how, how something, how heavy I can pick something up. Um, when you're building hypertrophy, so muscle size, you're looking at higher reps, bigger volume, less recovery. When you're looking at focusing on strength, you're looking at lower reps, probably more recovery in between, maybe less sets. And I think it's important to do both. And throughout my training history, I've typically done a phase of maybe six to eight weeks on one, six to eight weeks on another. And that's, I guess, as you become more advanced as, as someone, as an athlete or as someone just enjoying going to the gym. I think if you're going into the gym for the first time, you're using muscles for the first time, I would be looking at higher reps, lighter weight for someone to get used to the movement pattern. So if higher never reps used... of like, would you say 15 plus? Um, I think it depends on the muscle. Um, I would probably do 12 to 15 okay. with, with um, new people to, to a class because you're, if you're brand new to exercise from a strength perspective or a gym perspective, you're going to fatigue easy and early um but for anyone listening please don't be put off by that because there's something that's called which is a real thing by the way called newbie gains which is if you have not trained much in your life or at all when you go into the gym you will build muscle fast and obviously genetics plays into that but nine times out of ten most people will get results fast get stronger quicker build muscle and i, I don't mean in a bulky way i mean in a nice lean strong way so don't be put off <laughs> yeah. um I so, so my training um kind of weaves in and out so I have phases in the year when I'm really focused and I'm going four to five times a week and I'm just like dang, 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 dang. and then suddenly I just kind of drop off so I'm in yeah. a drop-off phase at the moment where I'm going about twice a week you know taking yeah. it easy 
But one thing that I love about what you've just said, newbie gains, um, I kind of get that every time I go back into my heavy training. So um, when I get back into it, I get, you know, I, I get the biggest changes in the first part of the program. And I'm just like, oh, yes. Like, and it's really motivating. But that's, motivating. yeah, it's so motivating. But do you feel the same? Do you feel like you have um times when you're really on it and times when you fall off or are you fairly consistent um yes to both I'm consistent in so far as I think I've trained um I guess for the over 20 years now I'm consistent in terms of I will always go to the gym but in terms of my motivation to get in there and how much I put into it it definitely ebbs and flows and I won't lie that when I when I had my injury earlier this year and I'm pretty sure most people have had an injury at some point in time where you can't exercise in the way that you're used to it's demoralizing it's demotivating you're like what can I do and I was kind of pretty much feeling like I was pushing myself through the motion um, and what I find helps for me is just reminding myself of my why and you know the older I get it's maintaining muscle mass maintaining my bone density you know using my brain <laughs> still yes. wanting to not you know not being frail and and so that helps helps a lot but 100% you go in sort of peaks and troughs um the thing I always say to my clients is that as well that muscle has a memory so you know if you have a break if you do have to have a break because of I don't know, you have a baby, you have a, a life, you know, occurrence that happens, you have an injury and you do take a break, you will come back and you will get back to where you were before. And, and as you mentioned, you'll probably come back stronger because you've got that motivation, you've got that drive, that excitement to get back into it and you see your body respond. Yeah, exactly. Um, so newbie gains, it's a real thing and it's it's a great thing. It's a very good thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we talked at the beginning about the different areas that you work in. So you talk about um, you know, sleep and you talk about stress. And so when it comes to um maintaining good muscle mass so just say someone's in a program what else besides protein which we'll come to next I promise yeah. um what else um is really important just as a sideline it's like just make sure you're doing this girls like just make sure you're doing this at the same rest time rest and recovery right yeah. rest and recovery because muscle is sadly or you know contrary to what we believe it's not built in the gym when we're in the gym and we're training our muscles we're effectively breaking down muscle fibers mm -hmm. um where the muscles grow stronger and bigger um is when we are resting and when we're recovering so you know i learned that the hard way so anyone out there who's training six mm -hmm. or seven days a week who's not sleeping properly who's not taking one or two rest days um, you are slowing down your progress and I promise that if you are someone that wants to get results you add in one to two rest days a week quality sleep quality nutrition you will change the results that you get overnight on literally you know what I love that what you've just said muscles aren't built in the gym I really yeah. love that that is so good I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna say it, <laughs> take it use it <laughs> circulate it <laughs> <laughs> muscles aren't built in the gym I really like that because that really that really drums it in it's like it's not just about what you do in the gym it's what you do when you leave the gym that's what's really important it's like you said mm -hmm. rest recovery getting sleep eating enough you know eating good quality calories that's just that's spot on yeah that's really good um so when it comes to you know, sleep is a different thing and stress is a different thing. But when it comes to protein, this is what I want to talk about as well. Um, how So protein, first of all, um, what is it? Because I'm sure people are like, okay, just, what is protein? Tell me what, what is, like, what do I, you know, what, what is it? What, what are the examples? So yeah, what is protein? I love that you bring it back to mm -hmm. basics because I think we can all assume that people have a certain knowledge and in in my years of working with, with different people often the understanding of what protein is it varies yeah so you know we have we have sort of three key macros macro, what we call macronutrients which is protein um, carbohydrates and fats some people include alcohol as a fourth one but let's stick with <laughs> the, the nutritious <laughs> ones for now um <laughs> And, and the body to utilize these three macros, um, so protein, carbohydrates, and fats, has to break them down into smaller molecules so the body can shuttle it around through the bloodstream 
um, to the tissues to do what it needs to do. So focusing on protein, um, when protein gets broken down, it gets broken down into what we call amino acids. Now there are 20 amino acids in total. The body can make an awful lot of those, but there are nine that we have to get from our diet. And those are called the essential amino acids. So when we're looking at protein, we're looking at sources that ideally give you all 20 amino acids. Not all of them do. Um, and that way we're, we're, we're ensuring that we're getting a complete amino acid profile into our diet. So foods that will give you a complete, we call them complete proteins, uh, meat and fish, um, eggs, to a certain extent, some dairy. Um, I think quinoa even is, is one of them. Um, is quinoa and, one and, of them? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And I, I mean, I, I better double check that and we'll put it in the notes if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it counts as, as a complete protein source insofar as it has the nine essential amino acids. I think in soy, it. soy does as well. Soy as well, yes. exactly. Yeah. Abs absolutely. So, um, so when I'm working with people and I'm trying to encourage them to make sure they have adequate protein, those are the first sources that I encourage them to go towards i mean this is not talking about the amounts this is looking at the types now obviously if you're a vegetarian if you're vegan those not all those sources are available to you um my vegetarians and my vegans um, i work with them really really closely to combine plant sources to make and you can get these amino acids these essential amino acids by combining plant sources it's just a little bit trickier it's a little bit harder um, the other thing I would say that's worth bearing in mind is they tend to be foods that are high, plant based foods tend to be higher in carbohydrates. So you really want to be looking at controlling your carbohydrates. And so just being a little bit careful there. Um, one tip and slightly off topic, but one tip that I use with my vegetarians and vegans is you can actually supplement with those essential amino acids. So you can get um, my favorite brand is something called uh, Amino Code by Ultra Human. I think Owen mentioned this on his podcast with you. Um, and that is a low sugar, almost zero sugar cordial, which just um, is a beautifully packaged and produced product, very clean, that has just the nine amino acids, the essential ones. Okay, and so you would recommend those for vegetarians and vegans? I for people who struggle to meet their protein requirements okay. easily. Okay. Um, yeah. And is that a daily supplement or? Yeah, you can take okay. it daily. For my vegetarians and vegans, most of them I will encourage to take daily because I work mainly with women. Mm -hmm. Women tend to find it harder to get adequate protein. Um, mm -hmm. And if you are vegetarian or vegan, then it's definitely harder to get from plant-based sources, as we've mentioned. Yeah. Um, and if you happen to be a woman that's trying to meet your protein sources, but at the same time, maybe lose fat or improve body composition, um, you might not want to necessarily have a really, really high carbohydrate diet or, yeah. you know, as, as much as, as some others might be able to, um, to I guess, uh, take in from their diet. Because protein is, is, is so important if you're wanting to build healthy muscle, but then also it's important for fat loss as well. Um, there are a few studies that I've seen um, that have basically um, found that the if you're meeting your protein requirements, then you're more likely to burn more body fat. And there's, there's quite a few studies that have quoted that as well. Yeah. Um, so it's really important for just overall body composition. So yeah. meeting your protein requirements is really key. So that brings me on to the obvious next question. What are the protein requirements? What do we need to be yeah. meeting each day? Yeah. Um gosh even before we jump into that i th i love that you mentioned that those studies uh, those particular studies because the reason that um it, i believe that it's easier for you to lose body fat when you're meeting your protein requirements is it's satiating it keeps you fuller for longer and so if you get adequate protein you are less likely to either um, have low blood sugar have food cravings or want to overeat mm -hmm. um, in addition what which i find fascinating is to break down protein to break down carbs and to break down fats uses a different amount of energy and we call it the thermic effect of food mm -hmm. so protein has a thermic effect of 20 25%. That means if you eat 100 calories of protein, you will only really absorb 75 calories because 25 calories are spent 
breaking it down and utilizing it in the body. Um, carbohydrates, I think it takes about six or seven percent um, to break down and fats almost nothing. We absorb that completely. <laughs> but yeah, it's not a bad thing because we need fats. But you know, maybe it may be another reason why why eating protein can help you with your fat loss goals. Yeah. Um, but back to your question in terms of you know what is what is the adequate amount? This is 100%. It depends. There's a recommend recommended daily amount, which is the RDA, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. Personally, I think that is far from optimal. That might be just about sufficient for your average person, not even just for optimal health, but just for survival. Absolute minimum. Absolute minimum. And I think what we should be looking for is um, for optimal health, not just for survival. Um, and then you add on to that, that each individual has a different protein requirement. So that is determined by your age. The older we get, the more protein that we need. It's determined by our activity levels. The more active we are, the more we need. What our immune status is and what our genetics are like and what our health history is like. So all of these things need to be looked at holistically. Um, and so therefore, when I when I talk about how much protein, I always have a pretty much of a range and it will probably range anything from, you know, 1.5, even up to 2.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. And, you know, 2.5 grams per kilogram is really high. Yeah. But if I'm working with, you know, a, a perimenopausal or menopausal woman, and at, when you're perimenopausal or menopausal, your estrogen um, is either lowered or low or almost flat line mm -hmm. our ability to respond to protein is diminished it's blunted so therefore we need more protein than pre that phase in life yeah. so um, yeah I think it's really important to look at the individual in front of you um, and to think within a range and to look at your sort of your personal circumstances so I've just been on my phone like doing some calculations then so you're 50 kilos right yeah, so, so, between 50-52, yeah. 50, 50, <laughs> depending <laughs> on where I am in my month. <laughs> I'm, I so get you there. Yeah, but, um, yeah. but um, so 2.5 um per kilo, so that's 125 grams per day. That's that's a that's a, a lot of protein for some people. They'd be like, wow. That would be the, that would definitely be the far, far end. So that, that end, far end, I would right. be looking at someone when I would use that kind of large calculation that would be someone who was probably older, older. probably menopausal mm -hmm. um probably um in a cal caloric deficit mm -hmm. so therefore i'm trying to offset the fact that um that they're, they're not getting enough calories and, and to make sure that the body doesn't break down muscle rather than fat as, as mm -hmm. a fuel source i think a much more realistic number for for the average person so anyone who wants to do the calculations now i would say maybe 1.3 or 1.5 times what your body weight is in kilograms i think right. that would be more realistic and then you would obviously increase yep. that if you're older if you're more active um if genetically you have a sort of a more of a, a need for more muscle mm -hmm. maybe you're under muscled um and and so forth okay so for a 50 kilo woman we're looking between like 65 up to 125 like there's quite a range there 125 would definitely be the yes. far end definitely. yeah definitely yeah. and if you know, if to keep it simple for, for the purposes of this discussion, then then maybe say like 1.3 to 2.3, maybe yeah. it's kind of a clearer range for, for, for the audience. Okay. So how does someone track how much protein they're having? Yeah, no, it's a brilliant question because when I first started out in, in nutrition, I thought 200 grams of protein was 200 grams of chicken. <laughs> Like, this is fantastic i'm eating my daily macro requirements so easily and, and i'm pretty sure 200 most grams of protein you're like oh my I'm god pretty... I can, this is so easy like i can have 400 yeah. grams what is everyone no, talking and, about and i'm not and, and this is not to underestimate your audience because i'm pretty sure they all know better than that but this was me 20 years ago when i was first starting i to appreciate the honesty that. that's that's good no that's good. good honesty yeah um yeah so um one of the easiest ways is i mean most food has a label on the back of it now anyway you can look at look at the label um, some of the tracking apps are really helpful because if you were to cook 
150 grams of cooked chicken. Um, you can plug that into my fitness power. You can put 150 grams cooked chicken and it'll probably come up with something like 30 grams of protein or thereabouts. And most meat fish protein is, is fairly similar when it comes down to the cooked weight. Um, and, and that would be one of the easiest ways, I think, to calculate it. If you're having something like a protein shake, it will normally say one scoop is 20 grams and it literally is 20 grams because it's been mm. processed. Um, so, you know, you get what it says on the tin. Um, again, with, with things like vegetables and pulses and nuts and seeds and all of these other amazing things that we really want in our diet, not so easy to calculate. So mm. that's when I personally tend to go to an app. Um, I think even the USDA has, has a website where you, where you can plug it in. But yeah, that your phone is, is your friend when it comes to that. But you don't have to track forever. Because mm. what I will find is when I first start working with people, there's a if they've never tracked before, they're not familiar with how much protein is in foods, it, it's a learning curve, might be a learning curve for a few weeks. But then after that, you're like, okay, this much chicken equals 30 or 35 grams of protein, you know, done. And then every time you see it, you can eyeball it on your plate, you know, you don't have to worry too much about it. Yeah, it gets gonna, easy. It, it does. And I was going to say, uh, I was going to second that, like, okay, if you're going to track your protein, you actually do have to weigh your food in the beginning like you yeah. do have to you know just get just get some cheap scales for the kitchen and yeah. um just just weigh it just pop it on and you know just take note and track it but you yeah. don't have to do it forever it can be something that you can just do for like seven days let's say and then yeah. after that you can just eyeball it and it's much much easier um I know it can be annoying at first um I you know can get quite frustrated when I'm weighing my food it's not the it's not the best thing um but you do get used to it and you, you don't do it forever and you can kind of you know just it's just learning it's learning about protein basically and I think if you're going to learn about any macro when you're building muscle I think protein is probably the first one to learn yeah. you know I agree and, and and it's data you can use forever going forward like once you know this what something about around this size gives you x amount of grams and um I think as well we tend to forget or and so every so often to sort of go back to weighing or measuring is a good reminder that oh actually I haven't been having enough protein yeah and then you sort of remind yourself to have a little bit more particularly you know if you're training in the gym or you've got particular health goals yeah just going off piece to just for a second um do you have any thoughts on the other macros like do you have any quantities that you like to recommend for those um yes and no um I think Again, this is really, really personal. Um, so it depends on the person. So if you are a very active individual, um, most of the times you can um, flip between fat and carbohydrates um, as, you know, fairly easily. And if you're fairly active, you'll be fairly metabolically flexible, meaning you can flip between the two for fuel sources. Um, a lot of women that I work with um, are what we call insulin sensitive or insulin resistant, sorry. So they're not insulin sensitive, meaning that they don't always manage carbohydrates particularly well. So how I would work with, with those particular women, and that could be because you have PCOS, because you're, it could be because you're carrying extra weight. Um, it could be due to any number of sort of meta metabolic disorder reasons but you can work on it and it's something that you can improve and so some of the ways that I will do that is maybe lower the carbohydrates initially mm -hmm. gradually build them up put them in and around workouts because if you do that you you'll have them before a workout it will fuel a workout if you have them after a workout the muscles are hungry and kind of use them effectively so um with, with certain individuals with certain health goals um or limitations then I I'll be a little bit more careful with the carbohydrates when it comes to fats um, I would say at a minimum because fats are where our hormones are made fats equals cholesterol equals healthy hormones I wouldn't go less than say 0.8 grams of fat per kilogram of body weight that would be on the low end um, and this is looking at optimal health and of course these fats we're looking to get them from you know really good sources so olive oil and healthy nuts and seeds and avocados and you know all of these amazing things that have additional sort of micronutrients yeah. within them 
so with carbohydrates you're kind of you're kind of strategic with them you're like so just them down and just have them at certain times like before training or after training certain or individuals and certain everyone's individuals different. everyone's yeah. different because some people can yeah. tolerate them very very yeah. well yeah. um yeah. but the Genetic people you deal with mostly um they don't tend to tolerate them as well um and i really like what you say about um metabolic flexibility you're kind of like which basically means you're switching between carbs and fat. So basically being able to, um, you know, lower the carbohydrates and be able to function still, you know, quite oh, like well. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was speaking to um, someone, um, I was speaking to Dr. Terry Walls actually the other day. Oh, and uh, yeah, I was just like, oh my God. Um, but she said something really awesome. She said um, for herself in her yeah. position, she likes to um, practice metabolic flexibility. So she likes yeah. to weave yeah. in between, um, you know, a ketogenic state and then a just a regular state, yeah. like a fed state yeah. with yeah. carbohydrates. And um, it, it kind of that that's what came up for me when you were talking about that yeah. um, kind of playing with carbs, like carbs is something that is, is quite fun. Like it's fun to play with yeah. and see and not, how you feel. Not to be scared of. Yeah. And I think to be scared two, of. two other thoughts that come to my mind, which is insulin sensitivity or our ability to process carbohydrates can vary in our different ages. So mm-hmm. when you get to perimenopause and menopause, a lot of women become more insulin resistant because of the declining right. hormones. Yes. So that's something to be aware of. And also within our cycle, so within the 28 day cycle, um, uh, particularly sort of around ovulation and before you bleed, a lot of women become more insulin resistant then. So that's almost sense seems counterintuitive because it that's, does, when, yeah. we're that's when everyone's craving yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's that's when we're like hankering um, for chocolate yeah <laughs> but I just need to sort of be aware of that and you know I see that time and time again so I use um continuous glucose monitors on a lot of my clients mm. so what that does is track their insulin sensitivity and how they respond yes. to food you yeah. see a change throughout their cycle which I think is um super super interesting yeah and just one more thing about that um, before we carry on with uh, protein because I have one more question about protein but um, with the continuous glucose monitor do you recommend that for the lay person do you recommend that you know yeah. just to get them used to their blood sugars yeah, yeah. it's fascinating and you know people we're all talk- different we like not everyone's the same which is crazy like yeah. and I think One of my biggest messages, if I want anyone to take one message away, is that not one size fits all. Mm. And we're conditioned that, oh, there's the keto diet, there's the this diet, there's the that diet, there's the Mediterranean diet. But there might be all these diets and they might suit a certain type of person, but does it suit you? And it's about really dialing in. If you work with someone, make sure they dial into what works for you as an individual. And one of the best ways to do that is... Um, a CGM because what you can do is you can track how your body responds to a certain food and back to what we're saying that will change depending on the time of the month Um, it will depend on their age it will depend on how much sleep they've had how much exercise they've had all of these things changes how we um, are able to metabolize food and in particular carbohydrates yeah so that's it's something that I am really late with I need to get myself one of those because I'm so curious but uh, Grand Cayman oh my gosh I don't know if you know much about it but basically um to get things delivered here it's really a nuisance <laughs> so yeah. they, I, I avoid getting things delivered here whenever I can so um yeah I'd have to yeah because I want to get it from you know one of the kind of companies like Levels or something because yeah because yeah, the, the education levels, and... levels is amazing um as a platform and the education yeah. I think with Levels you need a prescription okay um could be wrong but that was the case a few months ago if not um freestyle libra is okay. a one you can buy without needing a prescription i know that owen uses that in his practice in ireland i use it here in hong kong mm-hmm. um i'm sure between us we could we could get one to cayman yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, let us know yeah get, get the team, <laughs> teamwork um so when it comes to um so just kind of coming back to protein just for a short while Um, So we've talked about how much somebody needs and how to work out how much they need. So would that how how would that be spaced during the day? Is that um, spaced out equally or is it in one meal or like how can someone do this? I think 
for a number of reasons um i normally recommend to space it out throughout the day mm. um, i mean just first of all just from a sort of a, a gut health perspective you don't want to be overloading your gut with a big heavy huge meal that has 70 grams of protein in some people can do it um it's it's challenging um when you're looking at muscle protein synthesis so literally just building muscle what the research shows us is it's better spaced out sort of at least sort of two to three hours apart and sort of you know 30 to 40 grams per portion um i think really just making it so that it's easy for you to consume and not overwhelming is typically what I look for because I mainly work with women mm -hmm. not most are sort of there to sort of build big muscles but they want to maintain muscle or be healthier optimally um, so I try and um, aim for maybe three servings a day breakfast lunch dinner um, if you only eat two meals a day that's fine but maybe have a snack um, something else I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about carbohydrates and, and protein is most women train better fed. So there's a real, um, real popularity in doing fasted training. Mm. Um, and what all the research is showing us now is that that is not optimal to get the best results for women. And we see better results in terms of muscle strength, endurance, stamina and performance from training in a fed state. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, just off the back of that, so when I used to, when I was doing my training, like, you know, regularly, um, I would do it fasted because it was usually early in the morning and I was just yeah. like, oh gosh, like I just, I couldn't like even think about breakfast. I just like to smash yeah. out a session and do it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, to say whether that would, was optimal, um, I can't say that it particularly was, but um, it worked for my um, routine at the time. Um, but now I kind of push my training to the afternoon and I find that I'm a lot stronger in the afternoon and I don't know whether yeah. it's because I'm fed or whether it's just a circadian thing. Um, yeah. Actually, there was um, there was this interesting um, chart that I saw about circadian rhythms and it said something like between two o'clock and five o'clock in the afternoon, that's when your muscles are at their strongest or something like it. I, I, yeah. I'd need to kind of look back on that, but um, there's definitely a circadian thing when it comes to your muscles and when they're actually yeah. more like and it's strong different for everyone. Yeah, yeah, it's different you know, for everyone. So, yeah, so that might be your window. Someone else's might be late at night. Someone else's mm. might be in the morning. Um, and you kind of have to work with it a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, nighttime's challenging because you don't really want to elevate your cortisol, so you're super awake and can't sleep. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're at your strongest, so you know you sort of have to work with it. Yeah. Um, but those those women that like to train early in the morning like I wouldn't discourage that but what I would encourage is a small snack beforehand like a small protein snack it can be 15 grams um and if if you're sort of doing strength-based work yeah. if you're doing something that's cardiovascular then maybe um 30 grams of, of carbohydrates I think that's in line with Dr what Dr Stacey Sims advises as well for her um for her athletes too um, and so what I do in the morning, if I'm training first thing in the morning, I'll just have some of those amino acids um, mm. and, and that will give me approximately 15 grams of, of protein. And, and that's just like a cordial, you know, it doesn't slow me down and make me feel heavy. And just coming back to the the meals during the day, so you'd space them out. Um, but then what I wanted to draw special attention to is breakfast, because yeah. it's, it's so the case with most people that when it comes to dinner time, people have no problem getting their protein requirements. Um, yeah. But breakfast is the hardest meal to get protein, but it's it's almost the most important meal to get your protein because of what you said. You said that protein yeah. is satiating and yeah. you want to have a meal that is satiating first thing in the morning so that you can, yeah. it can kind of carry you through till, you know, whatever time you need to eat lunch. So um, protein in the morning is really important, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. satiating yes. and not only that it helps protein and fats breakfast will set you up for a nice stable blood sugar throughout the course of the day so the first meal of the day really sends a strong metabolic message to your body a what type of fuel source it mm -hmm. wants to burn but b you know, how is your blood sugar going to respond for the rest of the day so really it's i think one of the most important meals and if you're someone that doesn't wake up hungry that's also fine mm -hmm. but make sure that your first meal of the day is protein rich and and has some good healthy fats in it. I like to have eggs in the morning. Um, sometimes if I'm hungry, I'll add bacon to that, but not always. Um, yeah. 
but I find in the UK, for example, where we're both from, um, yeah. but it, th- that's hard for people because we're brought mm. up to have cereals and toast yes. and that's all we can kind of stomach in a way. I and I the idea of having, yeah. right, same like buttered toast with tea, but um, <laughs> I've got to have the tea, yeah. tea and toast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, to have meat in the morning or to have eggs in the morning like some it's not easy for people from our side of the world but what is it like in Hong Kong because I know that the diet is slightly different so do people find it easier to have protein in the morning I think gosh it's a good question um the women that I work with are pretty open and amenable to Mm. having a protein and fats based breakfast Mm. um so most of my clients will start with some kind of eggs um, with smoked salmon or avocado. Yeah, perfect. Or even a yeah. tea of seed pudding. Mm. Um, you can make that with almond milk. Um, big, mainly because they've got me nagging them every day to say, let's have a protein <laughs> in a <laughs> breakfast. But you know what? I don't really care what it is. Like as long as it's protein and fats, it could be yeah. left over from the night before mm. if that works for them. I just don't. My, from an ideal perspective, I don't want them having a bowl of porridge or a bowl of cereal mm. or some toast. And it's not just because it's carbohydrates, but carbohydrates um, lowers cortisol. And so we want cortisol. To, that's the hormone that gets us up in the morning. Mm. It wakes us up and it continues to rise for like 30, 45 minutes. Um, and, you know, and ideally sort of throughout the course of the day, it will then sort of gradually decline before you go to bed. So if you have carbohydrates as the first moment of your day, you're basically dampening the hormone that's got you up. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, yeah, and not only that, if you have carbohydrates first thing without protein and fats, um, you know, on its own naked carbs, you're really setting yourself up for a blood sugar roller coaster for the rest of the day. And it's hard to claw that back. Mm, yeah. Um, just a side question. Do you have any thoughts on calories? Do you use calories with your women or do you not focus on them too much? Depends. It really, mm. really depends. And I work with as I as mentioned like women for all different types of goals and for some women it's really just to feel healthier um and really so calories is not really relevant if I can teach them the healthy options to have mm. um because if you're choosing the right food sources in the right amounts um which become satiating you don't really need to think about it um I work with some women with food disorders so that's something that I would yeah. never think no no yeah. use into the way that we work um, and I work with some people who are data driven. And so they want to know their macros. Yes. They want to know their calories. So really, it's it's, again, not a one size fits all. It's what works for that person. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we might even start not looking at calories and as we sort of tailor down and they've got like a last little bit of weight to lose or you know an extra inch to come off before their wedding dress or whatever maybe we might do it then Mm. but it's definitely not you know a prerequisite I don't think I think you're right um when it comes down to the wire when it comes down to those last pounds or when it comes down to having to be a certain weight so let's say they're an athlete and they need to be a certain weight I think yeah. calories yeah. then is is yeah. a good use of time and effort. But I think if you're just a, a regular person just wanting to lose some weight and be healthy, then um, calories, um, I wouldn't put them first. I just wouldn't, unless they're data-driven, like you said. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, so finally, supplements. Um, so yes. you talked about amino acids. Are there any other supplements that you'd recommend for, you know, good quality muscle to help support somebody's <laughs> program? Yeah, um, this, I mean, I do believe in test don't guess when it when it comes mm. to something you know like you know see see if you're lacking in something but before you start supplementing but having having said that there are some supplements that I think you know the general populace could benefit from having at least the populace that I work with here in Hong Kong I would I put fish oil up there I think it's an incredible anti-inflammatory um and 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 also you know the, the fats that we consume trickle down to to us at a cellular level like every cell has a phospholipid membrane like a fat mm-hmm. membrane so what we put in our body from a fat perspective really hits us at a cellular level so fish oil definitely a good quality one um you know um what else would i add in there magnesium magnesium is responsible for over 300 plus enzymatic functions and so we're constantly depleting it particularly if you're active um and and our soil is very nutrient 
deficient mm -hmm. so we're not getting it from our foods as much as we used to so magnesium is is a and good stress one stress depletes it as well which obviously Absolutely. we're not short of that we're not short we're of stress these days we're not short of that uh, yeah my, my reason's a favorite for me um vitamin d i would say i have and i've looked at hundreds of blood work i have never seen someone with an optimal vitamin d level exactly unless that, that's what um, I find as well and it's it's crazy because I live in the sun and yet I'm yeah. still deficient yeah. and it's because and I hide from the sun and the sun cream yeah. and, we use sunscreen yeah. we wear sunglasses and we mm -hmm. synthesize it in our skin or through our retinas we're inside with um you know glass buildings um yeah so there's so many reasons why we don't absorb and, and synthesize it to make vitamin d in the way that we should um and it's that's so important for immunity and, and energy just generally um creatine mm. it is um actually the who have just listed it or fairly recently listed it as an essential supplement for women um right. i think people yes and i think people have historically always thought of it as a muscle building um supplement creatine it for those that don't know is um a compound that is found in meat and fish in small amounts. The body also makes it in our pancreas and our kidneys and our liver. Um, but really, um, to get optimal amounts, we we ideally would be supplementing with it. Mm -hmm. And the benefits are, you know, improved muscle strength, endurance, stamina, grip strength. Um, but also, it goes beyond that. It improves um, gut health. The my, my um, what's the word mucosal linings of of your intestines, cognition. Um, and, and so I particularly find it helpful for women in that perimenopause and menopause. So yeah, that would definitely be on my top list. Creatine, that's and a daily probably, supplement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Daily. And then okay. the final one I would say is a multivitamin. Okay. I think we just don't have the nutrients in the soil and therefore the food that we used to. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a good catch all, I think. Yeah. That's good advice. And do you know what? This whole talk has been so helpful for me as a refresh, first of all. But then also I'm thinking anybody listening to this who wants to get into training and they want to start looking after their muscle health, which is essential, by the way, essential. 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 <laughs> it's not it, it's essential. <laughs> like it's, it's it's essential to start looking at your muscle health and to start looking after it and um I just think that the tips that you've given are so actionable and um so easy to understand for pretty much any woman to be able to take on so um that was excellent thank you so much thank you so much oh, for that conversation thank you for having me that's all right is there anything else that you want to add that maybe we haven't spoken about yet is there anything that you just think you know just every ladies you need to know this before we finish or um just to it's never too late to change your health and it's never too late to put yourself first and if you're holding back for the right day or the right week or until all the holidays are over or the parties are over to prioritize your health please don't just start today start with something small a baby step it could just be a bit more protein it could be change your breakfast it could be adding some extra steps it could be a session in the gym just start today because there's no one that's more important than yourself when it comes to health because then you can be the best version of yourself and then the best version for other people in your life too uh, there's there's a quote that i saw yesterday actually um when you lift yourself you lift everyone else so yeah it's yeah. great like just, let's all rise let's rise yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um how how can people um find you what's what's the best way to find you and look you up um so instagram i have a website and i'm sure you'll you'll put those in in the show notes but the, the instagram is um bfit underscore so bfit underscore the right way spelt the and then my surname right w r w yeah way yeah, yeah. be fit and explore the right way <laughs> um and I, and I also have a, a website you can reach out to me on on either one of those or um, by email beth at be fit dash the right way dot com and i'd love to hear from anyone with any questions um, internationally any country anywhere yeah, any i work with people all over the world so yeah, yeah and i'm always happy to help